In a previous video, we looked at the existence and uniqueness theorem for di ordinary differential equations. And we studied this theorem and found out that there are a couple of conditions that once met guarantee that the differential equation along with the initial condition have a unique solution. So this relies on knowing two components. Number one, of course, we need to know the differential equation. Number two, we need to have an initial condition. There are differential equations for, uh, and for certain initial conditions, those, the solution to that differential equation may not exist. So for instance, when we look at the differential equation dy dt equals one over y, we notice that this function, if we were to plot dy dt, we treat this as a function. That's the important thing. This is a function. Its output is a rate of change. Its input is a value of the dependent variable. And so when we plot this thing, we would see something that looks like this. So this is no different than any rational function that we may have encountered in the past, but there's a vertical asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, so if you were to say you had an initial condition of say t naught y naught is the point zero zero, you'd have a problem, not because of the t value, but because of the y value. So you, of course, have an undefined rate of change when y equals zero. Um, in that case, that would immediately lead us to no conclusion. That doesn't mean there doesn't exist a unique solution for that initial condition. It just means that the theorem is inconclusive. Now, in particular cases, there may not be a solution. There may not be a unique solution. But at the very minimum, this theorem guarantees that uh, we cannot conclude anything under the condition that uh, our initial condition with respect to the differential equation is not uh, continuous at that point. Now, if it is continuous, we next check to see the partial derivative of dy dt. And if it is also continuous, in addition to dy dt being continuous at the initial condition, then we have established not only that a solution exists, but also that the solution is unique. Um, in some cases, we can say, yes, a solution exists, but solution exists, but no conclusion can be drawn about uniqueness. So the most important part, or the, the reason we like this theorem is because it, there's an important consequence. And that is, more, um, most importantly, if dy dt and the partial of dy dt are both continuous everywhere, then no two solution curves will ever intersect. After all, if every single initial condition I pick in the ty plane has a unique solution going through it, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be t equals zero, but if each of these points everywhere in this plane has only one solution curve going through it. That means, for instance, this point right here, if that's the solution curve going through it, then no other curve can go through it because that would imply that that point right there does not have a unique solution. And provided that these two conditions hold, we can guarantee that there will be a unique solution. So let's consider an example. Suppose uh, we look at the logistic growth population model, or typically what's used for populations, where often what we see when we uh, graph this y versus t is that there is an equilibrium point at y equals zero, and there's an equilibrium point at y equals c. So that means that if the existence of uniqueness theorem passes, that means that any initial condition that has a y value of zero will stay at zero for all time. And similarly, if an initial condition specifies that y equals c is the initial condition, then that will have a, uh, that will be an equilibrium forever. You'll be stuck at y equals c. Now that, that implies that anything in between there, if I pick an initial condition here or here or here, I know that that solution can never cross through y equals c and it can never cross through y equals zero because it would pass the existence and uniqueness theorem. So let's just prove that really quickly here. So what I'm going to do is just, just a little bit of algebra here to make the, the partial derivative simpler, but I'm going to go ahead and distribute. So I have ky times c. So I'll just write this as uh, k, k times c times y, um, and then distribute it here. So I'll have minus k times y squared. Now keep in mind that this is a constant. And uh, this is a constant. So those do not affect the uniqueness of the solution um, because they are, you know, potentially shouldn't be zero, right? Because it would make sense. It wouldn't be much of a model if, if the 
the growth rate parameter was zero or if the carrying capacity was zero. Um, but what I do notice is that this takes on the form of a quadratic function. So if I, if I rewrite this and I just let uh, KC, I'm going to call that uh, B. So I'll write that over here. So B times Y. Um, so B just takes on the value of what's in the parentheses there. And we'll just we'll go ahead and call that, um, that's a plus sign, excuse me, the positive term. Um, negative K, I'll bundle that negative K in there. So I'll call that A Y squared. And A I'm referring to as this whole quantity here. This is a quadratic function. Now if I plot D Y D T versus Y, the one thing that I will notice is that this, this function, again, is quadratic, and it will look something like this. So quadratic functions, there's no value of y that you can plug in here, that when you multiply it by a constant, and, or, or square it and then multiply it by a constant, and then multiply y by a constant and add them together, that you won't get a real number. This will always produce real numbers. So this guy is continuous everywhere. Well, how do you know? The easiest way to know is most functions are continuous everywhere except potentially somewhere. You know, that sounds very abstract, but what you were really hunting for here is, is the function ever undefined? And if so, where is it ever undefined at? Well, again, there's no y value that I can plug into this equation that won't produce a real number for the output, which is dy dt. So that's the easiest way to assess it. Where will this encounter problems, not typically when you have a square root, right, because we can't take square roots of negative numbers. Um, the other situation is, is when you have a function of y in a denominator, there's potentially some values of y that will make that denominator zero. Um, there are other cases, possibly, but these are probably the two most common where, where you have your dependent variable, or maybe even your, uh, your independent variable in the denominator that could zero out the denominator, or you could possibly have a square root of a negative number. The partial of this thing, so another way of saying partial is just it's the derivative of this function, dy dt, and we're going to treat y as the variable. Okay, so this is a constant. So uh, a constant times y to the first power, it's derivative, like derivative of 3x is 3. The derivative of a constant times y with respect to y is just the constant, so kc. Um, the derivative of a constant times y squared is 2 times the constant y to the first power, so using the power rule there. Um, so we could write this as minus 2ky to the first. And again, I'm going to look at this function. This is a constant. Um, oops, sorry, this whole term is a constant right here. This whole term is a constant right here. And so I have to ask myself, is there any number I can plug in for y where I won't get a real numbered output? Well, again, no, because I can multiply y by any real number, and I can add any two real numbers together. Therefore, the output of this expression this expression here, the output of that, will always be a real number. So let's take a look at this function. Now, um, I've kind of written over this, but using our intuition, we know that a solution that reaches equilibrium always stays in equilibrium. So we know that you cannot jump past an equilibrium point. So, right, so like here, if, if this function tends to the carrying capacity, that is your population is tending to some you know, maximum carrying capacity, and it gets inside of that carrying capacity, then it's stuck there because by definition of dy dt, if it ever reaches c, right, if, if y is ever equal to c, then this factor here in parentheses will be zero, and so dy dt will be zero. And so if, if your rate of change is zero, it's impossible to remove yourself from y equals c. And we can take a look at this using d field. We can see that I just plugged in y, y of zero equals three and y of zero equals zero to show that those are our two solutions for those two initial conditions, and we know that you'll stay flat forever, you'll stay flat forever there. And then I just kind of clicked on a, this equilibrium point, I can see that this function gets closer to the equilibrium, and of course this is asymptotic to the equilibrium, so it will never uh, reach it, it will just get closer and closer and closer. And same thing for this logistic behavior here, this is kind of the elongated S shape, so it would look like this, and have this really stretched out uh, S shape. And that will never, if we went backwards in time, we would notice that this function would approach y equals zero. And if t approaches infinity, then y will approach c. But again, this curve here and this curve here will never touch because we've just verified that uh, dy dt is continuous everywhere and the partial of dy dt with respect to y is continuous everywhere. Similarly down here, uh, if I click an initial condition, I clicked here, the forward trajectory solution will um, in this case, decay forever. 
But if we went back in time as t approaches negative infinity, we would notice that this curve approaches y equals zero, but again, never reaches it because of the existence of uniqueness theorem. Um, let's take a look at the slope field just to kind of verify this for some additional initial conditions. So here is the graph of So here's the graph of dy dt, and, and here are those different solution curves. And I, I can click on virtually any con initial condition that I want, and I can see that all the behaviors within an interval are similar, but in as much as it seems like they are reaching y equals 3, they are just getting asymptotically closer. And all of these initial conditions that I'm clicking on, again, notice that I'm not, I don't have to click at time 0. I can, my initial condition can be anything I want. And I can see that all, none of these solution curves are intersecting. Now, they, they may appear like they are, right, because um, they get so close to infinitesimally close together, but they don't ever intersect. And my guarantee is the existence and uniqueness theorem. So that's the beauty of the existence and uniqueness theorem is because it, it does give us information about those initial conditions. Um, furthermore, we can apply this to systems of differential equations. and we'll here define a linear system. So these could be two competing populations, perhaps, and dx, dt, so x can represent, you know, uh, some population. It could be, uh, it could be snowshoe hair and lynx, and, and the lynx uh, consumes the snowshoe hair, the rabbits. So we'll just call them foxes and rabbits, perhaps. And, so rabbits, has a, have, they have a certain growth rate model, and their growth rate is affected by their own population size as well as by the population size of the predator. Now, don't think this is a good predator-prey model, but it's, I'm just trying to use that as an example. So X can represent the um, number of rabbits, and Y can represent the number of foxes. And so in some way, now this, this could be a negative uh, function here, um, that affects the rate of change of the rabbits. And similarly, the number of rabbits in the population will affect the rate at which the foxes grow because that's one of their food sources. And of course, they reproduce as well. So the foxes, depending on their population size, will determine at what rate they grow. And so we have two initial conditions here, one for the rabbits and one for the foxes. And we want to know whether it's even worthwhile solving this system of differential equations, or at least whether this system has a unique solution. Now, A of T, B of T, C of T, and, and, and sorry, this should be D of T, uh, these are some functions, potentially constant. So A can be constant, B can be constant, C can be constant, and D can be constant, or any combination of constants and actual functions of time. Now, they have to be functions of time. So the Existence and uniqueness theorem for linear systems tells us that if A of T, B of T, C of T, and D of T are all continuous in a quote unquote neighborhood surrounding our initial condition, so at time zero, we have a rabbit population, we have a fox population, and if all of these functions are continuous uh, surrounding that initial condition, then X and T and Y of T are both unique solutions to the system. So let's just take an example. So let's say A of T equals five, B of T equals um, T squared plus two T, C of T equals, um, I don't know, we'll say sine of T, and we'll say D of T equals 52 plus uh, cosine of T. So we have to ask ourselves, all right, what's the initial condition? Well, let's say that at time zero, there are 15 foxes and, uh, sorry, 15 rabbits and 24 foxes. And so we have to ask ourselves, are these functions all continuous surrounding this point? Well, really what this boils down to is, um, are these continuous at the initial condition? Well, since they all depend on t, and I look at the value of t being equal to zero, all of these functions, five, so five is always continuous, t squared plus two t, that's a, that's a quadratic function. Quadratic functions are continuous everywhere. The sine function is continuous for all inputs. Uh, 52 plus cosine t is continuous for all inputs of t. Therefore, the system that has these coefficients of this form will be continuous uh, everywhere. And so this solution will be unique. 
meaning that if I do have two separate initial conditions, then, and so more importantly, regardless of what the number of rabbits and foxes are, and even more so, whatever the value of t is, these functions are always continuous. Therefore, if I do have an initial condition, and I have another initial condition, let's say time five, there are 16 rabbits and 23 foxes, I know that the solution curve that goes, that satisfies this point, and the separate solution curve that satisfies this point will never intersect. So that's how this also helps us think about systems, which we will investigate more in the future. But uh, there are, this is, this is a, a, a useful theorem in that, you know, if we do find initial uh, equilibrium points, we can argue whether or not it's possible for uh, those, those populations to ever cut through that equilibrium.